Good evening, everyone. My name is Donna Dodson. I work at the National Institute of Standards and Technology in Gaithersburg, Maryland, and I'm really pleased to be up on this stage um, just to be able to do an introduction of a colleague and good friend. And um, I was looking up to, to get uh, Michelle Mosca's formal bio, and I thought to myself, if I read all of this this evening with all of his many accomplishments, then we would be here for the full hour and he wouldn't get to his presentation. Because as most of you know who are involved in quantum information or quantum safe uh, cryptography, um, we have somebody this evening who has really led the field in so many ways. As the um, uh, founder of the Institute for Quantum Computing at the University of Waterloo, he has worked tirelessly over many years as we think about uh, quantum resistant cryptography, quantum key management, and safe computing in a quantum world. So we're really lucky to have him this evening. And with that, I'll give the podium to you. Thanks very much for that uh, very kind introduction. It's really a pleasure and honor uh, to be here today. Um, I mean, feel free to interrupt during the talk if there's something very specific and timely. Otherwise, there'd definitely be time for questions at the end of the talk. So, I'm, again, I'm delighted to be here to speak about a topic I've been very uh, uh, passionate about for over 20 years now. And that is cryptography and cybersecurity in the context of quantum computers. As we all know, cyber technologies are everywhere now. And, but just think back of where we were 20 years ago. I didn't have a cell phone, an email. I mean, I had it because I was at a university, but there was very few people I could email. And, and now we are here we are today. And where are we going to be in 20 years? It's going to be an even deeper, more ubiquitous part of our lives because we believe it brings exciting value and opportunity for us. Of course, the flip side of that is that it, there's greater and greater exposure, exposure to cyber attacks, to cyber criminals. So that's something that needs to be mitigated more and more. It's cybersecurity is an increasingly fundamental part of what it means to be secure and safe. And, and again, it's going to be unimaginably more of an issue 20 years from now, 10 to 20 years from now. And, and trying to protect against cyber threats and cyber attacks is really like going up a, a down escalator. Okay? You, you may think, have things sort of under control for now, but adversaries, you know, they're going to find continually look for new opportunities, different kinds of opportunities, uh, from human factor, implementations, to maybe attacking some of the fundamentals. So, so it's, it's important to realize that cybersecurity isn't about one tool, one solution, one silver bullet. It's not about a project. It's not about one vendor. Um, it's really about... Uh, an immune system, a cyber immune system that's capable of recognizing attacks, new weaknesses, and very quickly reacting to mitigate them. So what for me was surely the most unexpected uh, you know, vulnerability, or unexpected place to find a vulnerability in cybersecurity was in the discovery of this exciting new paradigm for physics that we know as quantum mechanics, discovered over a century ago. It's important, it's helpful at least, to recognize that quantum physics isn't so much a new theory as it is a new paradigm for physics. So a paradigm is a mathematical model in which you would express physical theories. So for example, if you're drawing maps of the surface of the Earth, we usually, in the, you know, in the old days, we worked in a flat Earth paradigm. Right? We, we would take very precise measurements of an island in a certain region, and then we would draw it on a flat surface because we thought centuries ago, that the Earth was flat. And it kind of worked until you started mapping out larger and larger region, regions of the Earth, and then things didn't make sense. You could try to make them make sense, but the explanations got more and more convoluted and, and just didn't really work. So 
However, if you switch the mathematical paradigm and try to embed, try to draw your model of the Earth on a sphere, <coughs> things worked again. So you didn't change any of the specific theories, any of the, the pictures you had of any region of Earth. You just changed the mathematical model in which, mathematical paradigm in which you were expressing these, these uh, theories, these maps, and so on. So quantum theory is just, <coughs> was a mathematical model that we came up with because the old one just wasn't working. And I'll explain a little bit what essentially was the one ingredient we needed to add to our mathematical model to be able to describe physics as we see it all around us. <coughs> but the reason I emphasize a paradigm versus a theory is a paradigm is a much more profound and inescapable thing. <coughs> and generally humans are not so great at accepting new paradigms. We reject them at all costs, typically until we have no other choice. And there's this one of my favorite quotes from Max Planck, one of the pioneers of quantum theory. But we eventually moved, you know, despite everyone, so many people's best efforts to reject quantum theory and come up with some classical explanation, we eventually accepted quantum physics as the paradigm for physics. And I just want to emphasize as well that it's often said we don't see quantum theory in our day-to-day -day lives. It's not exactly true. We see the, the impacts of quantum theory every day, of course. The stability of atoms. That we don't know how to explain that without quantum theory, for example. And here's one of my favorite uh, examples of a quantum experiment. It's called the Mach Zender Interferometer. This is an old photo by Dave Bacon and Antia's lab. Old lab at Singapore. Okay. What you see now, the only cheat here is this is a high intensity laser beam. However, in theory, in practice even, you can, low down, you can lower that intensity, and, and so it's essentially one particle of light at a time. We'll replace that laser with a photon gun, which is something people are actively working on. So it's one particle at a time. And what you'll notice is, if you study what happens to that, those particles as they go through that first uh, beam splitter, that's this thing right here, is half of the particles go straight through and half get reflected. Okay, you don't need a fancy new paradigm to explain that, some sort of random coin flip. And if you were to fire particles up this path, you'd notice half go through and half get reflected. Similarly, any particle coming along this path, half of them would go through and half would get reflected. So why is it that we see no light here? At first glance, this seems like a paradox. And you can try to salvage the theory, but it, it does, you can't really do it in a very natural way. Okay. I won't go into the mathematical details, but this, the simplest explanation for why this, why, let, let, let me see, let me just show you some of the, and, uh, the first time I saw this was in Paul Quiot's lab in Los Alamos, and I saw him here at the conference. If you, you know, if you block this path right here, right where that arrow is, so half of the light will hit, will hit you know, your hand or whatever you use to block it. And those other photons that reflect, they suddenly start splitting. Half of them go to the top detector up here, and half of them go here. And if you remove your hand, none of them go to the top detector anymore. How do those photons that went this way, remember these photons, they have no idea if you put your hand there or not. Single photon at a time, how do they know that your hand was there that your hand was down here, and therefore half of the time they should turn left. How could they know? Okay. You can come up with some convoluted classical explanation, not very natural, doesn't really work. There's more sophisticated experiments ruling those out. You need some sort of quantum explanation, which at a high level says that in some meaningful way that single photon is taking both of these paths at the same time. Now, a lot of my colleagues hate that explanation. The problem is I don't have a better one. And I, the reason they hate it typically is because you can easily misinterpret that to be more than it really is, but I will clarify that later. So in some meaningful way to explain this thing you can see with the naked eye, you need quantum theory to do it in any sort of elegant way. Now a new paradigm for physics inspires a new paradigm for information and computation and communication. Because information is stored in a physical medium, communicated through physical media, manipulated by physical processes. So you can't have a meaningful theory of information and computation 
divorced from a theory of physics. And as, you know, at the top we see as we get, as our bits of information are stored in smaller and smaller systems, we inevitably reach a realm where those quantum effects are really visible. And so at the bottom you can see approaches for building systems that we can control in a quantum mechanical way. So at the left we have the superconducting qubits. There's four of them on this chip, one, two, three, four. This is already old news in some sense. A couple years ago, uh, just under a couple years ago, uh, <coughs> nine of these, this, this lovely experiment by the Santa Barbara group, now part of Google, has been demonstrated. In the middle is, this is not an actual experiment, this is a cartoon for how we could, in principle, trap arrays of ions and get hundreds, thousands of them uh, and do large-scale quantum computation. This was really easy to do in PowerPoint. Um, in experiments in the lab, it's a little harder. Here's a gold chip at NIST that handles a handful of, of, of such ions. So it's starting, you know, in the 90s, if you looked at, you know, what's a qubit, what do these quantum computing experiments look like? They looked like physics experiments. Did not look like a computer. These are starting to look like computers. So the inevitable question, what is a quantum computer anyway? I've been talking about them like you're supposed to know what they are. Um, well, let me back up and say, well, what's a classical computer? Okay. In the 1940s, what was a classical computer? Ultimately, it's a device that encodes information in an array of bits, of systems that can be in one of two distinguishable states. And this device can manipulate those bits according to some simple rules. So you need some physical medium capable of encoding a zero and a one, so two distinguishable states. We label them zero and one. And here's 128 bits, a pattern, and it could be you know, those superconducting circuits, those little loops I described earlier. So if, if the electrons are going in one direction, that's a zero. If they're going in the other, it's a one, say. <clears throat> or it could be the ground state of an electron versus the excited state of an electron, or some more sophisticated internal states of these atoms or ions. So any two distinguishable states, and if you have three of these, you have three bits and so on, or 128 of them, as I illustrated. Now, what quantum mechanics tells us is any system that's capable of storing two or more distinguishable states <clears throat> can in some meaningful way embody both of those states at the same time. What does that mean? I mean, the reason we have a new paradigm is because we couldn't explain it in the old paradigm. So I think we all struggle with wanting to explain it in the old paradigm but something has to break down or we wouldn't have needed a new paradigm. So, and, and it breaks down in different ways for everybody else. You know, everyone has a different piece of, this ex, of an explanation that they don't grasp. But in some meaningful way, a single atom, if you say, well, what state is it in? It's in some meaningful way, it can be in this combination of zero and one. And why those weird numbers? Can anybody tell me what those numbers are? Yeah, there's square root of, of what? <clears throat> of one over two. So if you take, you know, seven, you know, 0.7 squared is 0.49. If you add that little bit of 0, 0.71, this, apart from round off error, gives you a half. So 0. 0.5 and 0. 0.5 if you square them. So that silly minus sign, when you square it, it goes away. So what quantum theory tells us is, you know, we're used to probabilities. And really, I, yeah, I really would say we're used to them. We don't really understand those either. There's, you talk to statisticians and probabilists and they will argue, uh, you know, very violently perhaps, that w whether they're Bayesians and frequentists. So it's, we don't always fully understand the foundations of the things that we feel we understand very well <coughs> at a high level. So what quantum mechanics tells us is underlying these probabilities that we're kind of used to is a richer reality which consists of square roots of probabilities. And these square roots can be m negative. They can also be complex, but we don't really need that to get the full power of quantum mechanics. So these square roots of probabilities are, un are our underlying reality. And mo in most of our day-to-day -day experience, we just see the squares of these numbers. We experience the squares of these numbers. <clears throat> but these minus signs or not actually have a real impact in physical reality. So in some meaningful way, a, zero, a, a quantum bit or a qubit can be in both zero and one at the same time. And I'll, and I'll tell you shortly what it doesn't mean, okay? What the, 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 
the overstatement that we want to avoid. <clears throat> so three bits can embody all eight of these states at the same time in some meaningful way. So these numbers, if you square them and add them up, you get one, okay? apart from round off. So you're in some way in all eight of these states, and if you, if you look at them, if you measure them, <clears throat> you're gonna get one of these eight states. You don't get all of them. So that's part of the catch. There's no free lunch. If you look at them, you get one of them, but you lose the other seven. <clears throat> okay? So you don't really have eight computers in your back pocket. You just have one with this weird, this, uh, this unusual ability to sort of explore all the states at the same time. <clears throat> so who cares? I mean, <clears throat> what is it good for? So one thing quantum computers can do that we don't in general know how to do with classical computers is explore global patterns. <clears throat> okay. Glo and you, you, know, you explore these global patterns, but you don't learn a lot about the local details. So this is part of the, the, the no free lunch. You can learn the local information, you can learn, <clears throat> you can sample one of these eight states, but then you lose the other seven. Right? So you don't learn anything about the collective state. Or another metaphor is, you know, you can see that you can learn important details about a forest without learning much about, without observing the trees. Now these are all metaphors, like what am I really saying here? So let me give you an example. <clears throat> so I'm trying hard to explain conceptually what, what quantum computers are good at. I'm trying to say that they, they, they can't do everything. They're not like having exponentially many parallel computers. <clears throat> Yet there's some things they can do that we only know how to do with exponentially many classical computers. So imagine a sequence of 128-bit numbers, okay? So just over, you know, around 40-digit numbers, but it's express them in binary, and on our computers, they're expressed as an array of bits, these zero, one states. And let's suppose you know how to take, an, you know, the integer one, which also would be expressed in binary, but I'm just expressing the inputs in usual decimal, but the outputs I'm going to express in binary, which is closer to the physical way they're represented in an actual computer chip. So I know how to go from one, I have software, an algorithm that takes one and computes the output. This could be if it's a pseudo-random number generator, the, you know, the first state in that sequence, or it could be the encryption of one or anything else. And then two goes to some other state and three goes to some other 128-bit state, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right, and 729 trillion, every single one of these 128-bit patterns are distinct. Now you might think, that can't be the case, there's only 128 bits, can they really? There, there must have been repetition. No, there doesn't have to be, okay? The thing with exponential growth is just 40 of these bits can store a number from one to a trillion. <coughs> So the first 40 alone can store a trillion different numbers. The next 40, another trillion. So now you have a trillion times a trillion, times a trillion, that's just 120 bits. And those last eight bits give you another 256 combinations. So it's vastly more combinations than 729 trillion with just 128 bits. So yes, you can have sequences that are distinct. You know, there's just countless distinct combinations. But let's imagine that this sequence eventually starts repeating. After an astronomically large number of distinct states, eventually this particular function starts repeating. <clears throat> so there you go, right? I'm sure you all recognize that was exactly the same pattern that one went to, right? And then 729 trillion, et cetera, et cetera, 765 goes to exactly the same pattern that two went to, and it cycles. Now classically, you can, you can find the pattern. Like, the pattern we care about here is, what is that repetition rate? I don't care what those, ran you don't care, I don't care what those random bit strings were. All I care about is after what period of time did they start repeating? If that's all you care about, classically, you have to sample a lot. You don't have to sample 729 trillion, but you have to sample roughly square root of 729 trillion times before you get, you get the same answer twice. It's also known as the birthday paradox. So in this room, there's almost surely two people with the same birthday. 
Okay, even once you have just 25 or so people, your chances are quite high. So you need square root of 729 trillion. You have a good chance of finding that period. But that's still a pretty big number. What a quantum computer can do is it can extor all those values. You give me 128 quantum bits and maybe a few more to store the inputs. And in one shot, one computation of that function, just one, it embodies all of those states over that entire period, repeating a few times, say. Now, if you just look at that, you get a random sample. You get a random number plus its output. Big deal. Okay, you don't need a quantum computer to do that. So don't do that. What you want to do is sort of jiggle it, apply special transformation to this that doesn't tell you what any of the states are, but will, with just one or two or three quantum glimpses, without learning any of the specific states, tell you what the period was. So a quantum computer can do that. So you may have heard of you know, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, right? Where you can learn momentum, but not position. You can learn position, but then you mess up the momentum. <clears throat> In a sense, we're learning a momentum-like property of all these states. But then we can't learn any of the particular states. If we learn the particular states, then we lose the massive superposition. So it's one or the other. But we're able to extract, a quantum computer allows you to extract that period with just one or two, or three, a very small number of glimpses. <clears throat> you might also, again, ask, who cares? What? So most people are not interested in finding the period of bizarre you know, artificial sequences of numbers. Okay. So what? So I was try, I'm trying to just to give you a concrete sense for the kinds of problems quantum computers can answer qualitatively, and what they can't do. So you don't learn all those 729 trillion states. All you learn is the period. So that's where why there's no free lunch. There's still you're still bounded in terms of what you can extract, but you can extract a small amount of information, but much much more efficiently than a classical computer would, would require. <clears throat> These same principles, these ideas of finding global properties without having to spend all your time learning all these local properties, allow you, for example, to simulate quantum materials. These are materials designed where you're tweaking parameters at the atomic level, trying to achieve some macroscopic behavior. And it's not always easy to predict from the microscopic properties what the macroscopic property is going to be. Is this weird material we've never built before going to be superconducting at minus 40 degrees Celsius? You know, how do you predict that? So we believe a quantum computer can help answer those kinds of questions. Not necessarily that specific question, but questions about quantum materials, some questions that a classical computer would take a long, you know, infeasibly amount, long, long amount of time to solve. You can also simulate chemical reactions at the quantum level. You can optimize the allocation of resources. So one of my students looked at the, 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 the possibility of using a quantum computer to help design buildings to be earthquake resistant. There are certain dampers you design into these buildings and you want to optimize for fixed budget what's the best you know, earthquake resistance you can engineer. And, and the algorithms have the sort of brute force aspect to them and quantum computers are good for fast tracking some of that searching. So there's this ambitious goal of building a large-scale quantum computer that can solve these really important problems. Along the way, we'll, we're going to develop, it's sort of like a moon shot, except in, you know, in this case, we definitely have very you know, you know, terrestrial applications of, of the result of a quantum computer. And furthermore, all the technologies needed to get there We'll have other applications. So one of the reasons it's so hard to build a quantum computer, and we don't have a large quantum computer, a large scale one today, is because these quantum bits are so sensitive. They're very sensitive to noise. They're sensitive to weak electromagnetic fields. Well, if you're sensitive to weak electromagnetic fields, you might be a really good sensor for electromagnetic radiation. So in the very short term, and even today, people are looking at using these primitive, well, primitive. They're, they're super sophisticated advanced technologies, but they're the first steps of these ambitious quantum computers. <clears throat> they're using them to 
advance oil exploration, medical imaging, and so on. But the truth of the matter is, we're surely only scratching the surface. What did we know in the 40s about what computers would be used for years later? What did we even know in the 90s about what the internet would be used for? We don't have these large-scale devices to try to explore with our own hands um, what they'll be good for. So I'm sure we're just scratching the surface here in terms of the wonderful applications these large-scale quantum computers will bring. However, there is one small catch. In the old paradigm, in the classical paradigm, multiplication is easy. We all know how to multiply. But if I give you a large number, finding the factors appears to be hard. <clears throat> and we, in fact, base the difficulty of this problem. We based much of our internet security on the difficulty of this problem, so-called RSA cryptography. It relies on these kinds of problems being hard. Organizations' public keys that are in your browser are often consist of a really, really large number. And if you could find those two factors, you could hack, you could pretend to be them, which is really, really bad if these are people you trust for your auto updates, for example. So it breaks down the entire mechanism for authenticating on the internet as well as establishing keys on the internet. So it would be catastrophic if this problem were not hard. Thing is, in the quantum paradigm, Peter Shor 1994 showed that, in fact, this factoring problem is easy with a quantum computer. And you might say, yes, but there's other, I go in my browser sometimes, and there's other ciphers, you know, other encryption algorithms you could use. Yeah, he broke those, too. Just, you know, why not? He added that to his paper. So he, all of, essentially, the currently used public key crypto can be broken. And it can be broken by using that boring problem that you surely didn't care about, that period-finding problem. <coughs> That's the fundamental ingredient to breaking, to solving this factoring problem and to finding discrete logs and so on. So we have a, prob a real practical problem on our hands as a consequence of a new paradigm for physics. Who would have thought? Who could have imagined such a thing? Now, do we need to worry now? Or is this something we can wait another 22 years for? Because to first order, we have, we've done a little bit, but not a lot. Uh, since 1994, to, you know, the internet still rely, 22 years later, we still rely on the difficulty of these problems we know will be broken by a quantum computer. <clears throat> we haven't patched it, not even close, okay? <clears throat> so can we wait another 5, 10, 22 years? Well, that depends. Some people can, some people can't. It depends on three parameters. What's the security shelf life of the information your system is protecting? In many years, it's zero years, so X is zero. But in some cases, it's 1, 5, 10, 50 years. Secondly, what's your migration time? What's Y? Your migration time. Can you patch this in a year, in five years, or 20 years? And in some cases, it probably could be done in a year. In other cases, it's looking more like 15 or more years. And lastly, what is your collapse time, Z or Z? When will a quantum computer or some other method break the currently deployed tools. Right. So for the next Y years, you're stuck with the quantum vulnerable stuff, right? Because the new stuff just isn't deployed by definition. That's your migration time. If you start, Im if you, if you start immediately, you have Y years where you're, everything you're encrypting is susceptible to these, to being recorded now and decrypted later. <clears throat> you're supposed to prevent people from reading it within X years. So those final decryptions are supposed to be secure for X years. But if X plus Y is bigger than Z, they won't be. So if X plus Y is, this is the only equation in my talk. So if X plus Y is bigger than Z, you have a problem. Because again, for the next Y years, you're stuck with these. So today, everything might be fine, actually. But the problem is, you're going as fast as you can, and you're not going to be able to deploy the quantum safe, <coughs> the, 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 the protocols designed to be safe against quantum computers in time. <coughs> so you have a problem, right? You have a business problem, at the very least, because you know every day I procrastinate today is another day, why years from now, that I'm going to be having this business dilemma of, well, what do I do? I'm not able to provide the X years of security. Do I just not do business? Do I buy insurance? Do I find another job? <coughs> You're going to have a problem. Now, if Y is bigger than Z, then you have an even bigger problem because then the system collapses and you don't have a fix. We're not talking about 
flipping a switch or just doing an auto update, we're saying the system is not ready to go. It's not ready for showtime and it breaks. So this is something we definitely want to avoid, at least for the most critical systems. One problem with these two equations is they don't have immediate impact on anyone's job. Not, well, not anyone, but most people's jobs. But I think what's starting to change because of the greater awareness in the last couple of years is organizations will start to be differentiated by whether or not they have a good plan for dealing with this quantum threat. Right? Five, ten years ago, it really didn't matter. Okay? <clears throat> today, even today, or you know, two years ago, you ask a vendor, I mean, some vendors were very much on top of it, but others, you'd get what this one Australian uh, cyber, ex cyber crime expert called the bovine stare. They had no clue what you're even talking about. <clears throat> and the other reaction is this, oh, yeah, it's, we got, yeah, we know it, yeah, it's, it's fine, don't worry, I and mean, they clearly don't know what they're talking about. But, Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so, uh, the old vine stairs, very similar. Uh, um, and the third reaction is, yes, we're, we understand the threat. We know what it means to our systems. We have a plan to remedy it before it's a problem. Right? We, we've analyzed the XYZ situation, and we're going to be fine. You want to be dealing with vendors and you know people who or in that third category, more and more. <clears throat> so one thing I've learned in the last five to ten years, I've really tried to push <clears throat> organizations to just please come up with your plan and, and you know, take care of this if you could please, is the technological part, the science part is as hard as it's really, really, really hard. I know it because you know, we're all doing it. <clears throat> it's not the hardest part. The hardest part is just getting a decision to make our system secure against this threat. Policy decisions and business decisions. If these aren't on roadmaps, because this is a long road, and very important decisions need to be made for these solutions to actually be deployed in practice, in time. There's some really, so ultimately it's a choice. So we can choose to embrace quantum technologies, these quantum computers and other technologies that will help us, and at the same time live in a relatively you know, in a, in a, cy a cyber-safe world. <clears throat> but it does require planning. We have to actually choose it and take the appropriate measures now <clears throat> to make sure our systems are quantum-safe before we want to take advantage of these quantum computers. <clears throat> and there's been some great, you know, very, very positive signs, very important decisions being made uh, in the last couple years. To a large extent here in the United States, um, where the NSA announced its plans for transitioning to quantum resistant cryptography, NIST, which has been nurturing in-house expertise for many years, has been preparing for this day, has been leading a very uh, impressive program to lead us to the standardization of a handful of what are called post-quantum. Um, so I mean, I use the word quantum safe to mean safe in an era with quantum computers. Others use this term post-quantum to mean cryptography designed in an era with quantum computers. So they're all essentially referring to the same thing. So there's the, the NIST work that's been ongoing for over a year now. And there'll be a, a lot, that, you know, it's only going to get harder. Uh, there's only going to be more work to be done in the coming years. But it's sort of stimulating and, and coordinating and organizing the very hard scientific work and and prototyping and testing and benchmarking that needs to get done for these quantum resistant codes to be ready for showtime. And our, our friends in Europe at, at Etsy, I mean, these are global, obviously uh, they both write global standards, at the end of the, the standards that are used around the world, uh, have also been very engaged in this space for many years. So these are very positive signs, but there's still a, a, lot, a lot more to be done in, in the coming years, and it's something you know, that we need to uh, continue to articulate and work hard towards. <clears throat> there is a positive side to having to retool your cryptographic infrastructure <clears throat> because normally if, you know, things ain't broke, don't fix them, right? So we knew the crypto infrastructure wasn't perfect, but it was kind of working. Now we know we have to fix it, so it gives us an opportunity to make it better than it ever was, better than we thought it could be. <clears throat> and one of the things we can do 
is potentially to bring in some of these quantum technologies that are being developed, to add them to the cryptographic ecosystem. <clears throat> so what are some of the, the cryptographic applications of quantum technologies that could be, that could be useful? <clears throat> well, the, an obvious one is random number generation. Right? We said if you prepare one of these superpositions of square root a half minus square root a half, and you measure it, you get a random, perfectly random coin flip. It's probably the most fundamental way to get a random coin flip. Or you could send a photon through a beam splitter. It's probably more practical. You get an outcome that is a very fundamental source of randomness. And I'll talk a little bit more about certifying these things. This is one. And there's commercial products we see out here today uh, selling these tools. <coughs> It seems trivial, like how hard can it be to flip a coin? In practice, it's, it's, it's a very, very difficult thing to do reliably. You need to know that even when your hardware fails, you know, then what? There's, there's, it's actually much, much harder in practice than you would think to have a really good, fast source of, of random numbers. A much more sophisticated protocol is called quantum key distribution, and I think See, the, the pioneers are in the audience, so, which is a great pleasure and honor. It's a method for establishing keys through an untrusted environment, through an untrusted medium. So like a fiber optic cable. So you have an Alice and a Bob. They can send photons through this medium, so fibers or free space are the obvious ones. Right? And you have to have a method for authentication, but that's a separate primitive that we also know how to do then they can establish private random bit, shared random bits. And, and sharing a random string is a fundamental tool in cryptography. Once you have that, there's good encryption algorithms and there's other cryptographic protocols you can achieve. <clears throat> Very often, the hardest part is establishing that key in the first place. And it just suffices to have an authentic but unsecure <clears throat> channel to do so. <clears throat> At a high level, the way quantum key establishment works is You've probably heard of the, you may have heard of the uncertainty principle. You may have heard of the fact that if you observe a quantum system, you disturb it. So that's a very fundamental property of quantum theory. There's a, there's a quantitative trade-off between how much information you extract and how much you disturb the system. So there's this intrinsic eavesdropper detectability. It's in the, like, the definition. It's in the actual framework of quantum theory. You can't escape it. So the idea at a high level, obviously the protocol that Gilles and Charlie came up with uh, is, is, is more sophisticated than this, but Alice, one of the parties, prepares a bunch of random bits in a state she knows, sends them through this untrusted medium to Bob, right? and then one of two things happens. Somebody eavesdropped or, or somebody didn't eavesdrop, or nobody eavesdropped. If somebody eavesdropped, they can detect it, and they abandon the session, and if they didn't, well, they now have a key, a shared randomness that nobody else looked at. So they win. They get a shared key. Now in the short term, it's, this is, and this has been, there's products that have been available for many years implementing this protocol. It's largely been a point-to-point -point solution on the order of tens of kilometers. Of course, colleagues in this, in this room at this conference are working very hard, doing amazing work in the last five, ten years to make global quantum networks a reality. <clears throat> okay. So you can actually transport a quantum bit arbitrarily long distances. <clears throat> We're not there yet, <clears throat> but there's two general strategies for getting there. One is using satellites, initially as a trusted intermediary, but eventually we won't even have to trust the satellite provider. <clears throat> and, and also these land-based repeaters. And again, the thought leaders <clears throat> in this space are here at this workshop. And you may have seen an announcement in the news recently, which was an important step forward, a valuable step forward for the space approach to getting long distance quantum communication. <clears throat> so a really important issue, you know, I, I, my background is actually in, in classical public key crypto, <clears throat> so I sort of knew the psychology of you know, conventional cryptographers, <clears throat> and I would I think annoy my physics colleagues in the 90s saying, but can you prove that you're implementing BB84? And they would get annoyed, because you know how hard it is in the 90s to get this thing working at all? 
the sources, the detectors, and here I am saying, yeah, but can you prove your, you know, and yeah, so they were annoyed, so I backed off a bit. <clears throat> but about a decade later, <clears throat> these concerns about, no, you know, are you, are you sure you're implementing it correctly? Are you sure there's no side channels became a reality? <clears throat> My colleagues, you know, Vadim Makarov, Hoi Kuang Lo, and others started actually attacking the physical implementations. To me, I thought that was a great day for the field because it was taking us to the next level of maturity. We are now starting <clears throat> to look at the physical security part which is fundamental to certifying these devices. <clears throat> now, you can certify things by you know, trusting, having some degree of trust in the person who built them and scrutinizing them at the physical level. That's one approach, and we're, we, of course, should do that. But quantum information gives us another approach <clears throat> for certifying that things are the way we think they are, that those things are, that is a valid quantum key distribution or a valid quantum random number generator. And it's based on this wonderful property called entanglement. Now initially when I heard of entanglement in the 90s, I thought, well this is just silly proving of theorems for no particular purpose. But then I re eventually realized this is a wonderful, very wonderful tool. <clears throat> so what is entanglement? So we're, you know, there's a very simple notion of correlation. Correlation is like when, you, when we were watching the Olympics a few weeks ago and everyone who's watching the same channel we're all getting the same bits on our TV screen. So these are all 100% correlated <coughs> displays of information. So it's 100% correlation. How can you be more than 100% correlated, you ask? Right? But you can. <coughs> and that's what entanglement is. So all these TV screens say we're 100% correlated, but let's just say then we, everybody picked up their remote control and then you know, hit a random channel, somehow randomized <coughs> their screens, they'd probably end up in a different screen, right? Things suddenly become uncorrelated. So there are transformations that would very quickly uncorrelate all these systems. <coughs> Whereas if these systems were entangled, and it's a much stronger form of correlation, there's certain randomizing, what would normally be a randomizing event, that leave it completely correlated still. So again, in classical case, this, this, this randomizing activity, this randomizing <coughs> action would leave you in random, independent random states. In the entangled case, it'd be random, but completely correlated. So you'd both see the same random bits on the screen. Right? If you prepare the same entangled state again, you have to repair it, prepare it again. Like once you, once you measure it, once you look at it, you've destroyed it. So you have to prepare it again, and you might measure, you know, do something which would normally, in, in the classical case, be randomizing each of them independently, but quantumly, with this entanglement, they would collapse to another Ident random but identical state at each side. This is a, a much stronger correlation than you can achieve classically. You know. Now, and if you get this maximal correlation, you get this wonderful property. I think it was Charlie Bennett who coined it as, you know, being monogamous. The TV screens, there was thousands, millions of them around the world watching the same 100% correlated information. But to be entanglement, only two things can be maximally entangled. If there's three or four or five other parties, they can, if these two are maximally entangled, that means no one else in the universe can know anything about what is inside those systems. So maximal entanglement implies monogamy. <clears throat> so that gives us a cryptographic application. Because <clears throat> Fallis and Bob can confirm their entanglement, and that's non-trivial, but there's ways to confirm they have maximal entanglement. And then if they measure, they will both get the same random bits of information. And those random bits of information make perfectly good cryptographic keys. And hackers, by definition of monogamy, will have no information about what those bits are. <clears throat> so this entanglement and, and verification of entanglement gives us a way to certify that quantum key distribution is happening faithfully. It also gives us a way to certify our random number generators. And actually NIST is, is doing some very important work in that direction. And many of the, the papers here today, and the talk not today, at this week, are on <clears throat> these related topics. So quantum mechanics gives us other uh, useful features. 
So entanglement, again, is a wonderful tool. It's, it's, it has many other applications as well. There's the famous no cloning theorem in, in quantum information theory. You can't take an unknown quantum state and make two or more copies of it. Okay? If you could, you could violate this principle of, you know, if you learn anything, you have to disturb it. Because what you would do is you would clone it and measure the clone and you keep the original unharmed, right? So it's just, uh, it's the same properties, but just a different way of looking at it, different implications. <clears throat> quantum information has other fundamental limits. There's a way, there's a sort of a quantum magnifying glass you can apply to search for things. Let's suppose there's, often in computer science, we can recognize the answer when we see it, but it's really hard to find the answer. And often the best we can do is just randomly guess. Quantum mechanics gives us a way of, of finding these guesses, these, these random <clears throat> things. If, if we have a mechanism for recognizing the answer, we can often find it a little faster, like quadratically faster, so substantially faster than just randomly guessing, but there's a limit. So instead of a, a billion you know, looks, we need square root of a billion looks. <clears throat> so it's still a lot of work. It's, 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 there's a speed up, but it's not a free lunch. You're still gonna have to do a lot of work. <clears throat> so the no cloning theorem, so actually one of the, the first paper in quantum cryptography was by Steven Wiesner at IBM. He thought no cloning, you know, and in fact, I don't even think the term no cloning had been coined then. <laughs> but, he, but essentially he was relying on the no cloning theorem, even though I think his work predates the no cloning theorem, <clears throat> where if you build your quantum, if your, your bills out of quantum states, then you won't be able to replicate them. <clears throat> but there you needed some sort of, seek, you had to communicate with the bank. And I, did, I didn't like that property. I mean, it's, it's fine, but wouldn't it be nice to have something that was like real money, where it was this anonymous, offline, checkable thing, system, some bill, some chip, that was offline, checkable, not counterfeitable, but could be verified. And there are indeed ways of achieving that. To achieve that, our colleague Scott Aronson came up with a beautiful theorem uh, as part of his seminal uh, um, quantum copy protection paper <clears throat> that showed you can interpolate between these two fundamental properties of quantum theory. So I don't have time to go into more detail, but this spun off a very interesting uh, new subfield of quantum cryptography. It was very active for a number of years. Um, and gave us many beautiful results in quantum information theory. And someday may lead to a very practical form of quantum money. Of course, whereas quantum random number generation and quantum key distribution is available commercially today and will continue to be more available over time, it will take decades before we have practical applications of quantum money as it's currently conceived. What else? Well, a lot more. If you go to this workshop, you'll see many other very fascinating, profound <coughs> applications <coughs> quantum information for achieving cryptographic objectives. A lot of what you see in the program is people pushing forward the experimental frontier, getting greater and greater performance and verifying. So it's, one, it's hard enough to do this stuff. Now you have to convince to a third party who doesn't trust you that you've done that. That's even hard, that's, that's much, much harder, but it's really important if we want this stuff to be, if we want these tools to be commercially available. We don't want, we want to minimize the amount of trust we have in our vendors. It's just, even, even if they're benevolent, how do you know the, 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 the equipment isn't failing? So there's a lot of work on achieving amazing experimental results, verification, the theoretical foundations of verification, what one can essentially refer to as a sort of quantum cloud computing, where there's some external untrusted party does the quantum computations for you, which makes sense because it's not like we expect to have quantum computers in our homes for many years to come. We're gonna, we want to be able to farm out our quantum computations and still retain security. So there's many interesting uh, research going on, many interesting results, many interesting applications to real world security, some short term, some long term. <clears throat> now some of the applications <clears throat> seem awfully uh, hypothetical and maybe not really so interesting <clears throat> for real world application. But that's so it's important to realize that that's actually fine. In fact, that's, that's really good. And, you know, cryptography 
even just conventional cryptography. I tried not to say classical cryptography because conventional cryptographers don't like that term because classical cryptography to a cryptographer means old cryptography from like Julius Caesar and the Visionaire cipher and so on, pre-modern cryptography. So conventional cryptography, a lot of what we call cryptography is really just fundamental information theory in a cryptographic paradigm where there's an adversary who you don't trust. Okay? And this sort of cryptography, even though it's not really intended to be a practical cybersecurity tool, is laying the foundations for both practical cryptography as well as information science in general. So for example, if you want to know, you know, in practice we want to solve problems. Can I solve this thing in a reasonable amount of time? And often the answer is, I don't know. And we want to say, well, there's different degrees of hopelessness. You know. What if I had the answer? Would I be able to convince you it was the answer? And if the answer is no, well, then this is starting to look like a really hopeless problem to solve efficiently. But if the answer is yes, then, then it's a, you know, a different degree of difficulty. And so you set up these games, what look like games, where there's somebody trying to convince you of the answer. And there's different rules that they play by. In some cases, they just send you the proof and you check it yourself. In other cases, you interact with them and so on. And it's, it's framed in a cryptographic setting but it's really shedding light on the foundations of information and computation itself. And the same can be said for quantum cryptography in the context of this conference. So a lot of what's going on at this conference is very applicable and can have very real world application in the short and medium term. Other results, very beautiful results, are forming the foundation of quantum information science itself and shedding light on fundamental physics, on, on questions in cosmology and high energy physics and also just information science in general and computation and communication in general. And a lot of the experimental quantum cryptography results we're seeing here today, I mean, experimental quantum cryptography, in addition to implementing very valuable tools, is also a paradigm for pushing forward the frontier of quantum technology development. So to, to wrap up, I tried to make three points today. One, quantum comp computing, disrupts, profoundly disrupts the way we do cryptography and cybersecurity today. The bright side is it gives us a wonderful opportunity to make our cryptographic, our cybersecurity foundations stronger than they ever were, stronger than we thought they could be. However, it does require serious decision making and very deliberate action now. The wait and see approach, I think, is, is far too risky. <clears throat> Secondly, quantum information uh, brings new tools to the table. I don't think, they're, I'm not, I never, they're not going to replace our conventional tools. They're going to complement our conventional tools. In the short term, QKD, one could call it a niche for point-to-point -point applications. Over time, it'll be a bigger niche or whatever you want to call it with trusted repeater and, and broader, you know, untrusted quantum networks. There'll always be applications where quantum channel's not practical. But I think it can be a very valuable addition to the, the cryptographic ecosystem and protect certain critical infrastructures uh, with a very high degree of assurance that we simply can't get with conventional technologies alone. <clears throat> and lastly, fundamental quantum cryptography is bringing new tools for understanding and developing information and communication science and technology. <clears throat> so this field, there's a picture of a tree here. You know, 10, 15 years ago, I, I, would, I wouldn't have necessarily guessed that we'd be here today with hundreds of people, many of the brightest, pe many of the brightest people I know from all around the world, with this amazing program in a workshop, a conference where it's really, really hard to get a paper accepted now. It's just so competitive. There's such, so much good work out there now in this field. And again, 15 years ago, it wasn't clear. A lot of what we were trying to do in quantum cryptography is finding yet another thing that didn't work. But now, uh, there's just this beautiful array of very deep and profound results. And it's also having practical application. So, as a member of this research community, I think we all feel very privileged to be able to work in this very profound and exciting um, field of research. And it's ex we're especially lucky um, and motivated by the fact that the results are actually, the, 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 the experiments are starting to catch up with the theory. That doesn't always happen in your lifetime. Okay? It's not only happening in our lifetime, it's happening now. And a lot of what we're doing is having, can have very profound implications for making our cyber... Uh, systems much more secure for years to come. So thank you so much for your time and I look forward to any questions. <clears throat>
So we talked about this uh, high class Y larger than Z theory and uh, for a couple of years. So now we are working on the post quantum cryptography. That means we are working on the crypto standard which can resistant to the quantum computing. Uh, so the part of the, this time is uh, more or less kind of predictable and because right now we do have quite a few very mature and very good um, team and like a digital signature like the public key encryption. However, about the C part, so how long it will take? So the, I, I just, uh, my question is about how we measure that the C is about a one single large scale quantum computer or the large uh, scale quantum computer are generally available. So how we measure that is Z. So, so I'll first more precisely define Z and then um, give some insight into how I measure it and how I advise people. So I define it, um, so I try to be concrete. Because uh, the people making decisions, they want like real numbers and they don't have to be definite, they don't have to be guaranteed, but they want, when people say, well, maybe, kind of, sort of, maybe in a decade or two, something might happen, they don't really know what, how to put that into their risk models. <clears throat> so by Z, I say, you know, we'll have a large enough quantum computer that can factor our, you know, 2048-bit numbers. So just to have something very concrete, we know that would have, you know, serious consequences. So that's what I mean, because you can also, I don't, so which is more ambitious than having something that outperforms classical computers, than having 100 logical qubits that simulate some physical system. I'm talking about something more ambitious. <clears throat> and there's a lot of moving parts, like what does it actually take to break RSA 2048? So we're doing theory work to reduce the physical requirements. We're trying to improve fault tolerance, and <clears throat> people are building the, the devices. <clears throat> So there's a lot of moving parts, so you sort of have to anticipate how are these things going to unfold over the next 10, 15, 20 years. And I, I think the algorithms will only get better, <clears throat> the codes will only get better, and the devices will only get better. <clears throat> so my, the way I approach, so my methodology at a very coarse level is, <clears throat> when will we get this scalable design <clears throat> that IARPA, for example, is funding a number of groups around the world to do? <clears throat> when will we get that? Is it three years, five years, seven years? And there's some probability distribution there. <clears throat> and when we get that design, how long will it take it to scale it? <clears throat> so, and, and then secondly, how big of a computer do we need? And that's a moving part. <clears throat> so now that you, so we have the design, <clears throat> some number of years in the future, we have some target size, and how long will it take us to scale to that size? <clears throat> and you make your estimates for all those moving parts and, and come up <clears throat> with uh, a, an estimate. And so my personal estimates are, <clears throat> that a decade is aggressive, but not impossible. So I give it you know, double digits on the order of one in seven chance <clears throat> that it could happen even in a decade. Which, again, one in seven means there's a six in seven chance it won't, right? So I'm not, trying to, I'm not suggesting we start selling quantum computing services a decade from now, but it, it, the risk is, is significant. <clears throat> but uh, by about 15 years from now, looking at all the possible things that could happen, <clears throat> those odds become you know, significant. It's not, I, I give it roughly even money 15 years from now. <clears throat> and depending who you talk to, you get a different answer as to how crazy that is. Um, so, so first of all, in 96, when I had to make a prediction for my master's exam, I said it'll take us 20 years to get to 20 qubits. So I'm, <clears throat> that's this year, and I think that's more or less what people are doing in the lab today, on the order of 10, 20 qubits. <clears throat> But that, so that was 20 years ago. I thought we'd be at a point where we would have a better idea of what it really takes to build a quantum computer, uh, how the errors work, and so on. And a lot of unexpected major advances have happened in those 20 years. Um, so I think, uh, you know, most people thought I was being very pessimistic, but I thought I was being realistic. Uh, now, so I got the next 10 to 20 year horizon for how I think it's all, you know, nothing is guaranteed, but if you, um, with cybersecurity, you have to err on the side of caution. Now, my colleagues who try to build quantum computers, especially the experimentalists, there's no way they're going to be promising uh, large-scale quantum computers. You know, they, they, they're very cautious in what they're promising. 
They want to under-promise and over-deliver. Um, and I think for any one individual, the chance of them achieving it is, is small. But we have a community, a growing community of people that are well-resourced. So, I mean, part of the calculation is how much more investment is there going to be in all the challenges. And, you know, we're going to have to be scaling, say, in five to seven years. In the, between now and that seven-year mark, are we doing research that will make it Oh, that'll, so we'll be hit the ground running in a sense on the scaling side. If we do everything serially, then you know we're definitely not going to have one in 10 or 15 years. But if there's a lot of parallel work, so part of it requires looking at the investments, who's working on it, what are they working on. It's it's a very hard uh, thing to assess. But I mean, I, I mean, I think myself and a number of people have been looking. You know, the U.S. government, of course, and others have been looking at it for a long time. So that's my spiel on Z or Z. And I would also say that the why thing is also needs some attention because although we have <coughs> post-quantum alternatives, our confidence in their security against classical attacks isn't at the level that we have for, say, ECC against classical attacks. Or at least for me, I don't think, I can't be that confident because they just haven't been looked at by that many people yet. <coughs> but, you know, I'm reasonably confident that these post-quantum schemes are resistant to classical attack, but... Um, they really need to be scrutinized a lot, lot more, and the work that, that NIST is doing and others are doing is, is bringing that scrutiny on. Because the last thing you want is for somebody to say, oh, right, sure, sure, double the key lengths and then we'll be secure. I mean, that, that's too late if it's already been deployed and used to protect long-term confidential, confidentiality. You need that scrutiny ASAP to get that level of confidence at least to what it is today for ECC. And then in terms of resilience to quantum attacks, we, there's no way we, we can be that level of, you know, that, have that degree of confidence against quantum attacks. Because we don't even have the quantum computers. Well, first of all, not many people have tried. And again, the work that's been going on in the last year or two is stimulating more people, including people in this room, to look at, there's been some nice work by a number of colleagues in this room, looking at the quantum resistance of these schemes. We need more of that. And until we have large-scale quantum computers, we can't even try heuristics, uh, which often the best algorithm, if you look at lattice basis reduction, the, the practice outperforms the theory. <coughs> so uh, you need the devices to be able to test these things. Thank you. I, I agree with you. So we are working on the right part. So we just need to watch the issue very carefully. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. That time will happen, so we will make sure that we have the standards there. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Any more questions? So are you willing to uh, make similar predictions about uh, quantum key distribution and quantum networks socially made for quantum computers? I haven't really... Uh, I don't have these predictions handy. Um, so, I mean, in terms of such concrete predictions, right? What would be the milestones? So, you know, the first QKD establishment over 10,000 kilometers, how many years will that take and so on? I don't, I don't have, uh, I, haven't, I haven't thought that through in detail. I have, I have rough ideas, but I haven't really crunched numbers and, and you know, tested their robustness. <clears throat> I mean, I'm confident it will happen, um, in, in the, you know, sooner than we'll have a quantum computer, a large quantum computer. But <clears throat> so that's an upper bound on my uh, probabilities. Uh, but I don't have uh, good, good uh, a concrete. But I can work on one, and we can maybe bet some a bottle of wine or something on it. 